In December of 1979, I was partway through eighth grade at the Seventh-day Adventist Pacific Union College Elementary School in Angwin, California, 94508. My father taught in the college's religion department, but he was being shipped with my mother to Washington, D.C. to prepare a defense of his heretical views. Just read the Wikipedia entry on my father, Desmond Ford. More details. Now, I thought I was condemned to move too, and I did not like that. I felt that every time I started to get halfway close to people, we had to move. I moved all around in my first four years of life because my mother Gwen was dying of bone cancer and I had various caregivers. Then my father remarried. We all moved to England for 18 months so Dad could do his second PhD. This one at Manchester University. And we returned to Avondale College in Australia in 1972. I was six. My dad followed Ellen G. White's teachings about holding kids out of school for as long as possible. And I finally started my formal education in second grade at age eight. I think this late start severely cost me in developing social skills. In May 1977, when I was 11, we moved to Pacific Union College in the Napa Valley. I liked it there and I did not want to leave. I think it was in December 1979 that my classmate Andy Muth invited me to his home for Sabbath lunch. It was the first time a classmate had invited me over for a Sabbath meal. Andy didn't want to, his mother made him. Andy was scared of my big mouth. I was a verbally aggressive kid. I enjoyed cutting people down. I was very excited by the invite. It sucks when you're not popular and you have to spend most of your life on your own. Andy's home had a whole different emotional temperature than mine. I have to understand that my father is a great man. He has two PhDs. He's a gifted evangelist. He can mesmerize a crowd. Thousands of people believe that he changed their life. The dad's a double threat. He can write academic books and he can speak to the common man about the great issues of life. My father doesn't just live his principles on the pulpit. He embodied them every day. I never saw him lose his temper and act out of control. He's very controlled, dedicated, feels a mission to show people Christ crucified. So dad didn't mess around with his life. He didn't waste it playing games or pursuing hobbies. He was a good father. He played Monopoly with me when I was a kid. He kicked the ball around for exercise. But my home was often cold, literally. Dad believed in the virtues of fresh air, even in winter. So he'd wrap up in blankets and leave the windows open and encourage us to follow his example. If I'd shut the windows, he'd often come around later and open them. And in such a battle in the winter, the one who opens windows always wins. It's easier to let the warm air out than to keep it in. So today I love a warm home. I keep things in my apartment a few degrees warmer than most people like. I think it's my overreaction to my childhood. So I hated being cold. Constantly dreamed I'd be adopted by a warm loving family, yet whenever I thought through the specifics I always concluded the benefits of my own home were outweighed the disadvantages and that was where I belonged. I loved having a dad who was a big shot and who was accomplishing great things in the world and knew great people and knew how to unlock lock books and to explain important matters to thousands of people. My father lived by the dicta that great people should discuss ideas and not people. So our table talk was usually about philosophy, theology, history, my father's theological battles. Ordinary matters such as girls were forbidden, not explicitly, just by my father's stern example, which my stepmother generally fell in with. So my parents did their best with me. They gave me far more than they had growing up. They loved me, they disciplined me, they gave me guidance about how to lead a good life. They connected me with God and with a religious community. I have no complaints. The things that they forbade in the home and that I later came to enjoy, well, my enjoyment was all the sweeter for having once been denied. But anyway, there I was in the Muth home after church that Sabbath afternoon. My first time there, even though I'd known the family since arrived in America the summer of 1977. So the first thing that struck me was the absence of tension. The two parents and their two kids were constantly kidding each other. These were fundamentally happy people. They weren't constantly striving to be great. They weren't weighed down by intellectual disputes. They did not regard the outside world as an enemy to be debunked. I just loved the temperature in the youth home. It was warm, it was emotionally warm, it was physically warm, it was a warm, happy place probably a cold winter's day outside, but inside it was warm and it was welcoming. 
Now, my father is dedicated to the health message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and so for my own good, I was not allowed to drink with my meals, no water, no juice, certainly no soda. It made digestion more difficult. So due to its high fat content, peanut butter was severely limited in my home. Just a thin spread was all I was allowed. But on this day, however, that all changed. I could drink all the juice I wanted with my meal. I could eat all the peanut butter I wanted. I could eat and drink anything I wanted. So a learned religion does not have to deform a family. It doesn't have to end pleasure in life. It doesn't have to cut you off from those around you. It can be an aid to a good life. So you probably don't understand my upbringing. Religion was a terribly swift sword. My parents basically lost contact with their families when they converted to Seventh-day Adventism in their teens, took on what looked to outsiders as a weird life. So I grew up not knowing what a niece or a nephew were. Well, I did, you know, I was a little shaky about uncle and aunt. Had almost no contact with my relatives, and those few times I did, it was very awkward. Because they were secular, my family was religious, and we seemed to have almost nothing in common. I didn't understand home and family as happy places. I was more familiar with them as battle stations. They were instruments for regrouping before renewing one's righteous assault on the wickedness of the world. The Muth family, however, was completely different. They made me feel happy, the most unfamiliar feeling. Till I met the Muth family, I felt like I was on the outside of life looking in. I was lost in fantasies of grandeur. I was terribly lonely and unhappy. Once I was with the Muse, I got to live life from the inside. I knew that no matter what happened, there would always be a place for me. Living life from the inside means you're connected to other people, and the way you do matters. You affect people, you matter, you have a role in the play and a place at the table. Mrs. Muth said she wanted me to be able to finish eighth grade with my class, and that if I needed to, I could stay with their family. So I've been the recipient of much kindness in my life, but I don't think anything ever touched me as deeply as this. I was dreading leaving my eighth grade and moving to Washington, D.C. did not want to leave my classmates behind before graduation. More than that, I wanted to be part of a normal, loving family. So I didn't get to stay with the Moose through June of 1980. But uh, my family had arranged for me somewhere else to stay at PUC. Still, I got to be friends with Andy, spent a lot of time at his home over the next five years. These were some of the happiest times of my life. And my family moved two and a half hours drive away in the fall of 1980 to Auburn, California. I kept coming back to Pacific Union College whenever I could stay with the Muse. I was a completely different person away from my home. In my dad's shadow, I was kind of a skeleton of a human being. He was the lead actor and I was just an extra. Away from my parents, I felt like I was the lead in my own movie. So I always felt giddy when I was on my way to Pacific Union College and I always felt sad when I left. In my teenage perspective, one place was warm and full of community. The other place was remote and lonely. One place I belonged, PUC. The other place I was just serving time. One place was happy, one place was sad. One home was tense, one home rang with laughter. One home constantly had people over to socialize, and one home did not.